Hi, everybody. I'm Erin Kennedy. Thanks for joining us on WPRI.com. We are here with Eyewitness News analyst, military general, Lieutenant General Reginald Centracchio. How I know you very well, yeah, but it's just a lot of words. Call me Reggie. Reggie. <laughs> All right, Reggie. We are going to talk about something that's affecting you personally. There's a new target for budget cuts, and it's military pensions. There's talk of changing it to a 401k style system, and also to be able to access it, you'd have to be 60 years old. It's in hopes of saving $250 billion over 20 years, but you say this is just way too vague for you. It is. You know, they talk about who, when, where, and to what degree. Now, certainly, you know, I'm in that category, having already been retired. Uh, there's no way you could ha apply this particular program to a 401k. This is, you just don't have that kind of time. My concern is that they would apply it to those already in, uh, perhaps serving uh, less than 10 years, as an example, or more than 10 years, because then you're dealing with the unfortunate scenario of trading off. Do you have a savings of money versus the quality of soldier we have in the military today, giving us the best army in the world? Uh, when you start to play with the, obviously, the, the quality and retention of expertise and well-trained people, then 350 billion or whatever the case is would not offset what you're going to lose as far as readiness is concerned. So I have a major concern with that. And when they talk about benefits, not only are they talking about pay, but they're talking about the military health care program and who would, how much that would uh, involve the difference between TRICARE, TRICARE for life, who would get it, how much your copay would be, what you have to pay for the basic premium. So you're talking about an awful lot of stuff that has not been discussed yet. And you say you're more concerned about this affecting enlistment and retention. Absolutely, especially retention. Uh, if you come, if you change the system and you have someone who's enlisting tomorrow, they know what the system is, so they make that decision. When you have someone that's been in the system for quite some time, well-trained, then you look at the retention aspects of it. You have an investment in our soldiers. You have a well-trained uh, individual. You can't possibly start to expect to replace them with new people and have the same level of expertise. It just doesn't go well. And that's my main concern, that you would obviously lose a lot of expertise, and the retention aspects of the military would certainly take a nosedive. But you're saying if somebody wa were to enlist tomorrow, and you said, all right, starting tomorrow, this changes. Absolutely, have no problem with that. And I would even go one step further, suggesting that if you, if you don't have tenure, meaning uh, probably the tenure mark is what we look at, uh, if you don't have 10 years, then you need to make a decision. Either you continue with a change in the system or you don't. And if you decide you're going to go for the full 20, then you would make that decision based, really based upon 10-year benchmark that we look to. And you said you're also concerned about the health care specifically and how it's going to affect soldiers and their families. Exactly. You know, when you talk about health care, being in the military, you would normally think you would go to a, 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 a military hospital or, or some other capability such as the VA and so on and so forth. But when you extract those two entities out, what does it mean? Uh, would we still be able to go to our own physician? Uh, could you get referrals? Would TRICARE pay for that? There's a mix when you're retired now between Medicare and the military retirement. They haven't, in my opinion, they haven't made that uh, distinction as to what impact it would have on the soldier and his family and what the benefits mean. They haven't really articulated that well. Okay. Let's move on now. Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta is sounding the alarm <clears throat> now on a defense cut trigger. They've already outlined $350 billion in cuts, but if lawmakers don't agree to further changes, they're going to lose another $1.2 trillion. So you feel that that could put national security in jeopardy? Absolutely. When you talk about uh, fooling around with the readiness of the United States military, you're talking about some real severe consequences. When you start talking trillions of dollars, you're talking about weapon systems not being able to go through the research and development phase, and not being able to field them, not having a, a system to be able to take over legacy systems, not to mention the fact that you don't have the expertise of personnel who will be retained in the military to take us from one weapon system to another and being able to uh, maintain a state of art of uh, such things as satellite uh, warfare, cyber terrorism, and those kinds of things, which really is the next level of, uh, of warfare that we need to face. But it seems that if there's anything popular to put on the chopping <clears throat> block, a lot of people can see a lot of trimming in the Defense Department budget. There's always room to trim. Trimming, the difference between trimming and cutting, 
uh, is the difference between getting a, a regular haircut and getting a, you know, a shave. If you want to maintain hair on your head, you can't do a shave. If you want to maintain good, sound weapon systems and quality military, you can't shave either. You need to trim, and I think that's exactly where some confusion comes in. $1.2 trillion out of a defense budget would be, in my opinion, devastating to our ability to maintain our readiness and our, uh, certainly our competitiveness with other countries in the world who could be, in fact be our potential enemy. So let's talk about then the thousands, the millions that kind of get lost in the middle. Uh, just in the headlines recently and in the past, there is a $7 wrench that actually costs to ship it to Afghanistan and some gray area in the middle turns out to be $170,000. How does that happen? The $7 wrench is still a $7 wrench when it gets to Afghanistan. It's how you apply the numbers to getting it from the concept to the actual wrench and then to execute actually putting in the field. So there's a lot of tangential considerations that come in, some, some uh, poor management, uh, poor accountability, uh, tagging on additional costs that really don't belong to that particular wrench, but they take advantage of it by trying to build up you know, future uh, budgets to be able to stay within research and development to develop another wrench. So there's an awful lot of poor management as it relates to the oversight of some of these programs, both in the military as well as within the Defense Department contractors that produce that wrench. So I know we're using a very crude analogy of the wrench, but it applies to most things. It could be a wrench, an airplane, a boat, a submarine. All those things certainly add into inflating the cost of the basic thing that you're talking about. And when you stop superimposing cost, then you can apply the cost to go from a $7 wrench to a, a multi-thousand dollar wrench. But where are the repercussions? Because if they're asking for mo more money after they've gone over budget, at which point do we say, sorry, I mean, you guys, you, you failed to miss the mark. You missed the mark. Therein lies the very uh, fallacy in the, or the weakness in the system. You know, the United States military has what we call quality control. They have inspectors that look at this. They, look, they have people that oversee contracts that are given to different contractors from the United States. And that they, they need to monitor this and they have benchmarks. Sometimes they don't monitor those benchmarks and they've already gone beyond uh, the time when they should have paid attention to the quality of what they're getting. And then once you get into the actual uh, production of the uh, whatever you're doing, uh, then it's too late. And someone says, well, wait a minute. Like, in today's news, we talk about the body armor. You know, that went through a whole rigmarole of uh, quality checks. Come to find out when you actually feel that it, it's not adequate. So you need to go back to the drawing board. Someone should pay, obviously, not, maybe not criminally, maybe so, I'm not sure, but somewhere along the line, someone didn't do their job, and I think it has much to do with how we monitor uh, concepts to actual production of whatever we, we need. And it has to do with the contractor themselves. Unfortunately, there's a lot of corruption there too. We saw it in Newport uh, over the last several months where people have their hands in there, they inflate what it actually costs to make whatever they're making, uh, and, there's, and they, nobody sees that until the end. And then they start to have some kind of accountability. Sometimes they pay criminally, sometimes they don't. But I think a lot of it has to do with the system itself within the military, making sure that what we're asking for, we get, and that there are benchmarks that we need to look at as it progresses. I think you're exactly right. It's just frustrating because these are mistakes that if you or I made it, we wouldn't have a job Exactly. Anymore. Some would say it's all over. Right. And you may even be required to pay back uh, whatever um, you cause the company to lose uh, in the United States government. Sometimes that's not possible uh, because of uh, a myriad of reasons, but you know, people sometimes are protected by law and it's really not protecting the best interest of the taxpayer as we uh, are trying to protect the individual rights versus what is good for the, for the general public. Right. The U.S. military recently announced that they had lost $360 million <clears throat> were spent on, that were spent on combat support for Afghanistan actually ended up with the Taliban. How did that happen? In Afghanistan, in Iraq, most of the Mideast countries, the way of doing business is really alien to you and I. You know, you have a contract, you have a set of rules, and sometimes they're abused. But in Iraq and Afghanistan, unfortunately, the people you have to go to, the power brokers, so to speak, 
are the ones that you have to go to neg to negotiate a particular service and specifically logistics. Let's use a, a basic example. You want to move this hum, this damaged Humvee from one point to another point. You have to get someone that has the capability to do that and you give them money to be able to do it. They tell you how much they want. And then in the meantime, a percentage of that may go to the actual movement, but a greater percentage goes to the Taliban who has the hand in the action to begin with and corruption on top of that. And they control so the roads. They control, ride. exactly. And so you may say, okay, I'll pay you $100 to move this particular vehicle. In the meantime, the Taliban are planting an IED someplace. They destroy not only the vehicle you're moving, but the logistics to go with it. And they come back to you and say, oh, sorry, we need to do it again. I need to give us more. And then they go through the whole consequence all over again and the whole sequence. In the meantime, the Taliban has the hand in it. Corruption has the hand in it. And you need to go back to the same people, unfortunately, because that's what you're dealing with. So how do we overcome that corruption? Well, you need to um, find out exactly who the people are. And we, and we have, we're extremely poor in that. We need to determine exactly whether they're credible, whether you can trust them. During the day, they seem to be reputable brokers. At night, they put their, uh, whatever the uniform might be, and they turn into Taliban. And then they start doing their own destruction so that the next day they put their, their, um, their different face on, if you will, and they start to renegotiate the same people two different faces mm -hmm. and it's extremely hard to deal with that because you don't have the backing of the people themselves I'm talking about the general Iraqi and Afghan people themselves to be able to say this guy is the one that did all the damage yesterday and he's doing the same thing to you today because of fear for their own life obviously um, let's move on now closer to home President Obama has said that there will be a heightened alert heightened security for the 10th anniversary of 9-11 mm. um, but the, you said that there hasn't been much chatter recently from terrorists or other people who would want to do harm to the US so do you think that that response is appropriate well before 9-11-01 uh, there was an awful lot of chatter as was related on the transaction and communications between uh, what we was were observing at that time and you know perhaps some known terrorist and some possibility with the Taliban and Al-Qaeda this time we're not seeing any kind of level of chatter. It's either because of two, one of two reasons. Either they're not going to do something or they've learned that communications um, um, considerations for uh, maintaining a low, low key and low visibility on what you're talking about can be monitored. So either they're really getting smart on how they, they communicate with each other and having uh, a communication security program in place or they're not going to do anything. I would perhaps not lean toward the latter. I would suggest that perhaps they have learned uh, that they can't openly start talking to each other because they're gonna be uh, discovered. One of the main things that we uh, found to be pretty uh, uh, effective on the um, Osama bin Laden raid was that there was very little communications within the United States military itself because they knew that they had someone was monitoring communications. So you go in, you do the plan, you get out of there, and very, they didn't know what happened until after the fact. Maybe, and I'm hopeful not, I hope they're not that smart, but I think they may be, that they need to understand when you're communicating, someone is always listening. And tell us quickly, please, so heightened security, what does that mean? That means that you, you watch for chatter. You watch for any kind of uh, abnormal transaction, communications, any, uh, any movement of, uh, of uh, perhaps um, something out of the ordinary going into an area. Why are there so many vehicles? Uh, we'll just say as an example, uh, why are there so many vehicles in Providence that look like someone's moving? Uh, where well, they could be, in fact, uh, vehicles that would contain explosives. Or why do we have an increased effort to try to... Uh, uh, breach security at the airlines. Why do we have more than, than normal uh, attempts at people trying to uh, go around the system? And those are indicators that maybe they're testing the system, looking for uh, perhaps weaknesses, looking for uh, weaknesses in the chain, so to speak, and we don't see any of that right now. But they're looking out for that, and so they heighten their security uh, uh, awareness and being able to say, well, there's something going on with our, our rail system. 
there's something going on with our, our uh, highway system, with our air system, with our, within our communications themselves, within our nuclear plants, anything that has some significant consequences if something goes wrong in that arena. We had a great story that aired yesterday. The 103rd Field Artillery Unit is back home in Rhode Island after spending more than a year in Kuwait. Is there going to be another unit, though, that's out there replacing them? You know, good question. Yes. Uh, as we speak, units are being geared up to uh, be deployed over the next several months. The one thing that people uh, really need to understand is that although the, 100, the 103rd Field Artillery is back home, some of these same soldiers may be mobilized all over again with different units. Some voluntarily, others maybe not. So you only have so many troops in a particular force structure. If you constantly go back to that same force structure, you may be using different units, but you're using the same soldiers. So some of these soldiers coming home after a year in Kuwait will be mobilized again with a different unit, perhaps to Afghanistan or some other place. So this must be difficult on the soldiers and their tremendous families. tremendous stress. Uh, the, um, the methodology that was supposed to be used was uh, you bring the guard into a one-year deployment uh, once every three to five years. Uh, that was thrown out the window several years ago because we see that uh, we see the same units being called back into uh, mobilization within less than a year in some cases uh, because of the kinds of units more than anything else. As we start to see the drawdown, uh, perhaps we'll see a little bit less than this. But my concern is, as you see a drawdown, you're going to see more of a requirement to protect the troops that we leave there, uh, even though they're in a training status, someone has to protect them. So I'm really concerned that we may not see a smooth transition to the eventual pullout. So we need to keep local soldiers in our thoughts. Amen. Anything else you want to add tonight? No, I think that's good, but uh, certainly uh, an indication of what we need to be aware of over the next several weeks as we get closer to the 10th anniversary, each of us has a responsibility to be more aware of our surroundings because that's one of the key indicators that uh, we should be uh, really ready to say something isn't right right here and then report it accordingly. If you see something, say something. Amen. All right, Reggie, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you.